think the word dialogue um, brings very close to the following speakers. And uh, I'm very thrilled to introduce them. They are uh, yeah, my good friends and uh, my mentors. So Professor Renata Sarkhan is, uh, is my good mentor from Kaposkuri University. And Yulia Prokofieva is my colleague from the project, ERC project on ethnobotany and divided generation, which actually is led by uh, Renata. And to add also a bit more is just the speakers before the lecture actually mentioned the science, the mission of the scientist is to make a connection with community, so make a network. And I think the lab of Renata is actually the things what she's doing with the team. And I'm happy to be part of the team as well. And basically what is going on in the lab is that uh, they are on the ground level working with the communities to actually understand um, the connection between the users of the plants. And not only, it's a connection what the people or communities have with the plants. So I will not take more time and uh, welcome Renata on board. And as I understand, Renata first will introduce and, and bring us into the subject, followed by Julia. And afterwards, Renata will summarize. And I know there are some tasks as well. And both of the presentations will be shared by Renata. So Renata, the floor is yours. Let's have a try if we can hear you and see your presentation. Good afternoon to everyone. Do you hear me? Nice and clear. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really sorry I cannot be there with you. Uh, this would have been a really nice exchange, but uh, diseases are going, uh, are visiting people. So, <laughs> and uh, there are other diseases like flu uh, still existing beyond uh, COVID. So I happened to catch one and it's not very pleasant. So I didn't want to share it with you. Uh, and this is also the reason why I'm not going to show you the, the video because uh, <laughs> you don't want to see me in this condition. <clears throat> but um, nevertheless, we speak today about uh, the role of human in plant conservation. And uh, Yule will bring the example from very specific place. But before we start, and I already see uh, the correlation with previous speakers in, uh, in many way uh, of the topic we are going to touch today, even though for many of you, it may come uh, a bit uh, out of the blue, uh, like not directly connected to botany and plant conservation, but there is connection, I can assure you. And uh, as uh, Alessandro Chiarucci said, uh, we need to solve global problems, uh, the problems which are affecting our next generations. We cannot do it within one discipline, actually. We have uh, to involve interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. And in this sense, ethnobotany is uh, actually offering a way for the botany uh, how to get to the people. And this is what, what we will be talking about. Uh, however, before I give you a task, and let's see if it's working, um, to turn to your neighbor in the room uh, where you are sitting, and just very briefly, in one minute, to discuss uh, what is the role of common people in plant conservation. And in the second moment, to tell your neighbor about your direct experience, if you have involved people into the conservation activities and how did it went. And uh, Yulia and Baiba will take care. I have an overview of either you speak with each other or not. And uh, then I would like you to share uh, how many of you have had positive or negative or neutral experience with this question. So you have uh, one minute, two minutes for this uh, activity. Please. <laughs> uh, 
Just tell the story. So uh, please raise hands, uh, people who whose neighbor have had positive experience in communicating uh, ideas about plant conservation to people. Raise your hand. Uh, not your personal, but your neighbors. Okay, it looks like the main contact disappeared. What about people online? Well, you have not had the chance to speak with your neighbors, I guess. But uh, can you think of yourself then? What have been your positive or negative or neutral experience? You you cannot see me because I'm not putting the camera in. Sorry, just uh... so uh, please raise your hands. Uh, those who have uh, whose neighbor have described positive uh, experience in connecting people and plants or in explaining the need for conservation, if you have any. One, one, two, two, three. But it's not only three. Okay, uh, how many have negative? No negative, zero. Okay, in this case, uh, does it mean you don't have experience or, or they have been neutral? Could you, yeah, could you please repeat the question once again, please? So, uh, given that you have only three positive experiences and no negative, does it mean that the rest of experience do not exist? or uh, they were neutral? Experience about? About explaining conservation needs to ordinary people. Common people, uh, people who do not have background in botany. Well, it was a tricky question. Okay, <laughs> uh, let's go back. So it was about this experience in involving people into the conservation activities. But let's uh, move forward. Mm, so here we are. Um, here comes um, just a little, you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, insight into the project. We did not study conservation of plants, of course, but we studied attitudes of people toward plants, uh, especially plants, and uh, environment in general. And uh, the project of which I am the PI uh, is spread over the eight countries and nine different regions, uh, which means that they are actually the research spots are divided by state borders, which were established either in around 1940s or 1992, and uh, the specific region in which Yulia works uh, has uh, two different time spans of division. Uh, in uh, 92 and in 44, so uh, we studied the effect of centralization, uh, but 
but uh, among others, uh, we've discovered a very interesting phenomenon, which is not that new in ethnobotany actually, but uh, is rather uh, probably unexpected for, for the botanical society. Uh, we'll, I will start from far beyond. What is storytelling? Uh, every one of you probably knows, uh, oh, connects uh, the old lady to the oral history, uh, which means uh, that at certain moment when there were no books yet existing, and this is especially appealing to the cultures which do not have long uh, written history. Uh, the whole ways of lives were given to the next generation through the storytelling. And this is why our brains are very prone to uh, listen to stories because this was a way of giving the information. And of course, also in the countries with, uh, or nations with uh, uh, written culture uh, developed or um, in place uh, for longer time already, the were majority of the population which were not literate and still communicated the general aspects of life, including the use of plants, through stories, through narration. And of course, you may think of a very uh, common story of Cinderella. Uh, the narratives can be very complex like this one, uh, but they all have a common structure in a way because they present uh, at the beginning something to connect with the people. So, here in, in the Cinderella story, uh, everyone has some sad moment in their life. So it starts with a misery story uh, of Cinderella living in her step family. And then something good happens. And then again, something bad happens. And uh, there is a uh, some bigger uh, achievement like uh, dancing with the prince in this case. And then there is a disappointment because Cinderella has uh, to flee. And of course, in every story, there is happy ever, ever after, even though this uh, happy ever after appeared in the uh, fairy tales recently and was made for pedagogical reasons. So what is actually a narrative? Uh, we, we cannot say that uh, the fairy tale is the only narrative, of course not. But can we also transfer this to animal communication, for example? Is a bee dancing a narrative? This is a question to you. What do you think? Bee dance a narrative. Is it bee dance? Can we translate bee dance in the narrative? It, of course, it all depends on how we look at the things, but. Actually, we can say that bee dance is a narrative because it is narrating where to go and how to get there in order to get the honey. So the mechanism of the transfer of information uh, is of course without words, but it is 
conceptually the same. And even now, when we have a child asking a mother, why the birds fly away in the fall, well, in Nordic countries, uh, we tend to answer with a narrative. So we are not creating the set of facts in the child's mind, but we are putting it into a narrative format, even a very short narrative format. And this helps to create a connection with the information which is already there. And this is actually the crucial point. So to know how to attach the new information, we need to know what is already present in the person's knowledge and mind uh, before we can transfer the new information there. Now, I give the word to Yulia. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, today I'm going to talk about importance of understanding human driving environmental changes from local perspective, from grassroots, from local peoples, from communities. Community representations of environmental relevant issues are really, really very crucial to underpinning responses. In our case, it's conservation. Making environmental change at uh, the local level by connecting to silent local issues and co-benefits compromises an important step in bridging the gap between more global analysis like biodiversity loss and its relevance more locally, particularly for communities, especially we, if we're gonna talk about ethnic minorities. Although the effect of human-driven environmental change are global, but the impact are felt more at the local level. Environmental representations, these narratives which Renata spoke uh, previously, do not uh, directly reflect actual, phys actual physical conditions, but are interpreted through social and cultural layers of understanding or not understanding that uh, shape environmental issues. Here in uh, our report on our discussion today, we seek to clarify how two ethnic minorities, Lithuanians and Polis, view environmental issues now and in the past, and such perceptions act as an important indicators of how local communities make sense of what is happening in their surroundings. Please, next slide, Renata. Renata, thank you very much. Okay. Um, <laughs> our case studies explores perception of human driven environmental change and it affects on the local vegetation in rural communities of two ethnic groups at the border area between Poland, Lithuania, and Belarus. Please, next slide. Uh, previous one, thank you. Uh, yes. Belarus, Poland, and Lithuania are located in geographical crossroads that links the forested lands of northeastern Europe and uh, to the sea lanes of the Adriatic Ocean and fertile plains of the Eurasian frontier. Studied border region uh, between Poland, Lithuania and Belarus has long been a crossroads for trading roads and uh, has been subject to a series of changes in the national status. It is now mainly inhabited by Lithuanians and Polis, and it is characterized by plain, hilly rural areas it is currently experiencing uh, remarkable rural immigration, 
Um, in the summer of 2018 and 2019, we conducted uh, 162 series structured interviews among these two ethnic groups in several border villages. Please, next slide. Our survivor uh, survey uh, shows that perception of environmental conditions, current environmental conditions, do not vary considerably between these two ethnic groups, but they are very, very vary within each country. What does it mean? Now, it means that it's really, really matter social, political, economical, cultural as well, religious conditions which these countries have. Uh, this is a border between EU and non-EU countries, like uh, for now, Poland and Lithuania is in European Union and Belarus is not European Union. And, uh, but in the past, it was, for example, very interesting uh, that uh, uh, Poland was under communist regime and Belarusian and Lithuania, Belarus and Lithuania was uh, under Soviet, like in, included, included in the Soviet Union. And it, all, all, all these uh, things uh, were impacted on the transformation and creation this environmental narrative which we are talking about. Please, next slide. Uh, to get some sense of the kind of terms used to describe local environment in each community, we did a word cloud, uh, created two word clouds. We displayed the most frequently used words in the discussion notions, issues from the interviews. Um, both communities used the same terms in discussing the environment, such as people, good, less, both. In Belarus, worse, uh, the word worse, uh, was also commonly used in talking about the environment, that now is worse, of course which may reflect the dominance of the issues of plant extinction, less, the plants is less now. Um, also negative words such as pollution, nothing, nothing at all, no problem, also fertilizers, chemicals, also came up relatively regularly as did the word less. Next, uh, this is for uh, Polish informants and here uh, for Lithuanians. Actually, uh, terms relating to agricultural activities were also notable. These include tractors, melioration, clogged, bog drainage, mowing, like human activities. Meanwhile, in Poland, commonly used terms appeared uh, with the community, uh, community's rural position. This includes chemicals, desiccation, wild forest. Words such as polluted, concerned, worried were also used. Next slide, please. And uh, we began our work from uh, mapping main environmental change trends, which our informants reported. And uh, for three countries, it is the same trends like human activities, which are really like, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, biodiversity loss, by our uh, biological diversity loss, uh, it's the same like human activities, depopulation, internal migration, land use cover, land use change, land cover change. This is the main trends which are uh, pointed out by our informants. Next slide, please. But uh, the main question for us was, what do informants think as it causes the reported changes? drivers of the environmental change. According to the, uh, our results, most informants see human activities 
as a main cause of the changes they describe. Looking closer at the details, this include agriculture activities and actually very interesting retail use of plants. For us, it was very interesting to see uh, which triggers people have when they are describing the nature. What is uh, like? How do they uh, can understand this um, that the nature the environment surroundings are, for example, are changing? And uh, for people from these communities, was um, really very important ritual use of plants. They are mainly Roman Catholics. They are. Uh, repeating every year, for example, uh, they are collecting plants for some rituals in the, this uh, calendar, and they can see that, for example, some plants are disappearing. And this is, uh, for us, was very crucial that uh, some cultural features very, very, very impact on uh, our perceptions, our perceptions of environmental change. In, in general, respondents, uh, particularly in Belarus and Lithuania, referred to overuse, unwise use of natural plant resources, irresponsible, selfish behavior, or not taking care of the environment were mentioned along uh, with uh, evaluating money more than the consequences of such behaviors, economic activities, modernization as well. But if Belarusians and Lithuanians pointed out on the Soviet period, like previous past, police uh, recent uh, the behavior in the recent times now. Change con conservation and consumption uh, overuse plants in the past. Uh, patterns, societal changes, like fall of uh, Soviet Union. Bad manners of the youth religious denomination came up in the explanations as well. Few more, the population uh, and internal migration were named in this context in Belarus and Lithuania. In Poland, with regard to modern technologies, they use a lot, um, sometimes pointed out of the role of use of chemicals as the reason, the reason for change. And also people in Poland, they reported uh, selling of plants, uh, economic activities, uh, foraging for the daily diet, uh, also like one of the reasons. Could you please, uh, next slide, show us. And uh, the vast majority of our informants from all three countries perceive and expect changes in local vegetation. Our respondents reported perceptions about less unhealthy or dying trees, loss of medicinal plants. Actually, they are also perceiving, perceiving more uh, when uh, disappearing plants for medicinal use. It means that for them, it's very, very important. Uh, which they used for ritual purposes, as well as I said, as effect of changing land cover and practices. Next slide, please. Here you can see uh, families specifically mentioned uh, by our informants as in danger or already disappeared. Just want to point out that only few mentioned species was protected. A cousin at least the occurrence of new invasive species where more weeds was also especially mentioned. And next slide, please. Regarding to use of plants, uh, even 85% of our participants uh, pointed out that the plants harvested for food, medicine is like different kind of uh, in countries, uh, different countries, uh, sub countries uh, uses of plants, medicine, ritual, decoration, household are becoming scarce due to poor growth caused by intensive human activities. We are returning back to 
the role of human in uh, plant conservation and uh, plant disappearing. Next slide, please. And uh, the majority of our informants reported that they observe some particular customs, taboos, or cultural regulations in order to sustain the decreasing number of plants which are still available for use. These local practices were identified as a conservational, conservation measures which are, could be useful. Local uh, conservation and uh, why our study is so important because exploring current messages simple messages, very simple messages, and social actors. Our work opens up new understandings of transforming local ecological knowledge and how it might be harmed in the cause of building these new contemporary strategic responses and to environmental changes. As today landscape are the result of many, many, many layers of past natural processes and uh, human interventions, uh, historical perspective is needed. Uh, we are also considering culture is a driver, big driver of environmental change. It's one of the most complex dimensions uh, which are of environmental change and usually remains this, this, uh, this impact. This is just this suggests that people look for visible causes in the absence of wider understanding. They look at this and uh, the media, the media also play a key role in this new or old discourse, new environmental change or environmental discourse uh, narrative making. Thus, local support for plants, resources, management of yield and success in uh, uh, conservation. Such supports are strongly, strongly influenced by perceptions which we studied in the, of the impacts of uh, experience by local communities and the uh, opinions, uh, locals of management and uh, of course, it's also opinion uh, like policymakers, governance, and that's it. It's necessary that for, for researchers, for us, uh, natural resources officers, and uh, to interact with local communities, as Bible said, uh, to access local ecological knowledge because it's super, extremely, extremely uh, important for us. That is for my side, Renata. You can. Uh, Yes, please, thank you very much. But Renata will share, yeah. Not unmute my microphone. Thank you very much, Julia, uh, for your presentation. And uh, now <laughs> I will ask you to do the next uh, task. So, uh, have you or how many or just have you noticed any narrative lines which you could differentiate in your last presentation? Uh, then, which of them touched you personally or professionally? And which of them would you re-narrate? And I would say you have uh, five minutes to stretch your leg to make five, mm -hmm. four or five person groups and to go out for these five minutes uh, talking with someone you don't know very well. So okay. sorry for interruption, we don't have time, but maybe someone uh, yes, can share. Uh, uh, some opinions about these narratives. We don't have time, sorry, Renata. Okay, uh, I see. Or you can uh, continue your... Um... Okay, you can discuss this later, but this could have been a very important connection uh, which you could have made 
uh, with the next idea. So uh, I'm going more in deep with the narrative theory in which uh, on which we rely in our research. And um, <clears throat> the idea is uh, not ours, of course. Um, all good things already said. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a uh, formulation by uh, Robert Schiller, uh, and he was taking as an example the Great Depression of uh, 1920s, uh, showing that uh, the simple narrative had created the Great Depression. He defines narrative uh, the simple story or easily expressed explanation of events that many people want to bring up in a conversation or on news or on social media because it can be used to stimulate the concerns or emotions of others and or because it appears to advance self-interest. Uh, Schiller argues that it's difficult to predict which narratives the elements or the mutations become suddenly popular or go viral. But once they do, they spread far, even worldwide, with economic impact. Well, we are interested in conservation impact, but the idea is actually the same. So you can see very similar uh, uh, spread of the virus, and uh, we just have experienced uh, uh, the spread of COVID uh, with a bit different structure, but the same. The idea is coming from virology. Schiller stressed that the narratives are major vectors of rapid change in culture and ultimately in economic behavior. And if the story can establish a reference point, which Yula uh, named as trigger points, and uh, we prefer to use trigger points for that, uh, it will have influence on decisions. Uh, you probably everyone know the story of uh, Greta Thunberg, how quickly her idea uh, became viral. And this is because what she said, uh, her dress was touching people. There were many students who were sensible to what she said. And this attracted students in her campaign very quickly and very efficiently. However, uh, it's a very long way from, from the acknowledgement of the problem and uh, to taking action. And uh, there is a beautiful cartoon by Sir Anderson, uh, where you can see that even though our brain says, well, or our body says that uh, uh, there is something wrong with the weather, we still prefer to not to think about it and enjoy the beautiful day, enjoy the warmer climate, maybe the presence of some beautiful flowers which are not native or instead invasive, and we don't, don't really bother with it. But in all, in one, how we present and interpret the narrative depends on our background. Uh, and in order to uh, create the trigger point, the narrative has to touch our heart and soul and address our needs, fears, hopes, uh, and uh, in the people it is meant for. So if you take an example of our message, for example, we want to tell people that they should take care of endangered plants. We just cannot go to them uh, and bring our top-down message. Now there is a policy and you need to take care. Well, no one cares for policies on the general level, 
Well, if then uh, it does not last for long. Uh, but what we need to understand, as Yula said, about the cultural uh, effect of culture, but within this, there is also a personal narrative. And there is, of course, the PN represents personal narrative. Uh, they do repeat in people in some way, and they are culturally dependent. So we first need to map the personal narratives of the people and then develop the grand narratives which can actually affect the way they act. Uh, in our case, related to uh, endangered plants. And you can see there's just uh, random examples uh, every person has the touching point, the trigger point uh, in a different part of the personal narrative. And when the narrative starts going uh, within the population itself, then uh, other people themselves spread it and bring us closer to the goal. So uh, we don't have much time, but uh, I'm open to your questions. Thank you for listening. So please your questions to me, to Yulia. Or you can write to us email also. Yes, we, are, we will be really happy to, okay, to collaborate. Personally, I do remarketing, which are really working. When uh, the narrative uh, of uh, product which you are selling, let's say, uh, touching you this emotion. Sorry, there were, I think generally there were probably several broad appreciated several lines of narrative in the what we're talking about description of environmental conditions. And then like people look at direct causes more than more general yeah. causes. So it's not some people look at direct causes. Second question is something like which one touched us? Well, that touched me because you know, unchecked is going on and they're still looking at direct causes. And so that is probably the one that we're going to have to re narrate. Yeah. And also, there are a lot of people Shoot. which are very skeptical about that. It's allow, uh, another target of, uh, no, thank you. Uh, if I may add to that, uh, we developed this idea uh, based on Schiller, of course, but we developed the future, I think, I hope, uh, uh, through the example of uh, Ivan Chai, which is uh, Epilobium angustifolium turned into national Russian tea. Uh, with a great, uh, greatly designed narratives, uh, diverse narratives, which were 51, if I remember correctly, I can share the link to the article in the, um, in the chat later. And uh, uh, the, the whole idea came from there. We saw how nicely it was designed and how quickly it actually worked. In five years, everyone wanted to have one chai, wanted to do it themselves uh, because they were touching different trigger points in people. So uh, if it is used for this, uh, 
idea of, of this cause. So if narrative is used for negativity, uh, it can be used also for positivity, for creating a positive outcome. For creating, for creating environmental hope. Yeah, uh, also this. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we are returning our flows. Bye bye. Jiva, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Julia and Renata.